we are familiar with the short-term debt cycle or short-term debt cycle, but we are not really familiar uh, because of the you know great time span of 75 to 100 years. There is a long-term debt cycle, which you know which we are right now at the peak probably, and this is why I'm really looking forward to talk to Dylan Leclerc who works at uh, Bitcoin Magazine, also co-founder of 21pragmatism.com. He wrote an excellent article on the conclusion of the long-term debt cycle and the rise of Bitcoin and is hyper-Bitcoinization in reality the coming of the debt, ju debt ju jubilee. So uh, without further ado, this is going to be my uh, really exciting talk with uh, Dylan Leclerc. And let me know what you think. Uh, if you have any questions, please uh, write an email to kd at kvandavan.com or DM me on Twitter. And I'm really looking forward to this talk. Hope you're gonna enjoy this. Well, welcome to the show, Dylan. Dylan Leclerc, how are you doing? Doing great, thanks for having me on. Excited to talk. Yeah, Dylan, I mean, you came out of nowhere. I mean, I didn't know you, to be honest with you, before you are co-founder of 21 Pragmatism and a content creator on Bitcoin Magazine. And uh, you made some uh, really, you wrote a mind boggling article, which a really comprehensive article on the long uh, debt cycle and Bitcoin. But before we get into that, would you, would you tell my listeners, like, how, what's your path into the rabbit hole of Bitcoin? And what was the reason, motivation, intention of writing this article? Yeah, um, so... My rabbit hole journey, uh, it was it was over the last couple of years. Um, I'm 20 years old. Uh, I I kind of stumbled upon Bitcoin at the end of 2017, but didn't didn't think anything of it. Um, just had some people that I knew and like the ICO boom. Uh, I, I, I mean, I wasn't even old enough to <laughs> to, you know, log into an exchange or or even know how to buy any of this stuff. But I started to, to want to like get in, uh, involved in investing. Um, I, I didn't know, didn't even know what I didn't know. Um, so looked up like best investors and, and was started, started reading a little bit about Warren Buffett and <laughs> looked up the investors podcast, just like not even knowing what that was and stumbled upon Preston Pish and the stuff that he's doing. Um, and so I started reading a lot, um, read like, uh, rich dad, poor dad, and, and just basic like building blocks, like. Um, like learning what an asset and a liability was and, and just did a lot of studying um, um, because, I mean, my goal was never to be rich. My, my, my goal now um, is just is freedom. And so money is, is power um, and, it, and it gives you optionality in life with, with really anything. Um, like money itself isn't the goal, you know? Um, and so I, I was on that path for a little bit um, trying to like, learn about value investing. And when I turned 18, I signed up for Robin Hood and Coinbase and, and uh, I, I like was learning about stocks and whatnot, but really I, I, I have like a passion for, for just like, you know, knowledge. Um, I have a passion for learning um, with really anything. I, I kind of have like an obsessive personality. Um, and so in a, in a like kind of a journey for truth, um, I kept learning a little bit more and the, the legacy financial system is, it's, uh, it doesn't make sense when, or I guess not doesn't make sense, but there's, there's a lot of things wrong when you kind of peel back the onion um, that is, is kind of, you're supposed to accept as normal and they don't, it's not normal. Um, and so that kind of led me to Bitcoin, not so much that I knew Bitcoin or crypto as, as I'm coming in as a newbie. Um, not that I knew that it was a solution, but I'm just learning it in parallel. Um, this is just this kind of thing that me as an, as a 17, as an 18 year old kid, like I don't have any opposition to it because I don't know. I just don't know anything. Um, and so I, I have a Twitter and I had a Twitter and I, I log on and luckily I found the maximalist uh, crowd really early on, um, which was, which was great. Right. When I, when I uh, turned 18, Plan B dropped his uh, stock to flow model and like Twitter was buzzing about it. And, and so I kind of luckily stumbled upon uh, Bitcoin maximalist Twitter very, uh, very early on. Um, and that was, that was the start of my rabbit hole journey. And, and like everybody that I 
could kind of see and knew what they were talking about. I tried to learn as much as I could from them. So a lot of books and podcasts um, over the past two years, but yeah, that was, that was the start of my, of my rabbit hole journey. Um, and it's been, it's been a long, you know, a long, long way since, even though it's only been like two years, it's, it's felt like a decade. Um, and I guess to, to get to how I wrote this piece and why I did um, in this, in this journey of, of learning um, and, and trying to figure out truth, I, I stumbled upon a lot of really, really smart people with, with um, things that I thought were important. Jeff Booth, his, his amazing book, The Price of Tomorrow. Um, I wrote The Bitcoin Standard. Um, and then finally, um, which was my, well, my piece was based off of, which was uh, Ray Dalio's Big Debt Crises. Um, that really contextualized for me when I, when I read that, it was kind of an aha moment, like where we are in, in history right now, 2020, 2021 is, is big. It's really, really big. Um, and so that was a point for me where Bitcoin is, is a nascent technology. It's a monetary asset, but it's what the world needs at this point. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I kind of, kind of went everywhere uh, in the past five minutes there, but, uh, yeah, that's a quick rundown. (laughs) Do you have any questions from there? No, your, your article is really super structured. Um, because, you know, you just mentioned Ray Dalio. I mean, the guy is a really interesting figure. Would you say one of the reasons that he just doesn't get it? I mean, even Greg Foss said, just said recently he was, Greg Foss was on my show too. And then on Preston Pish's show, he also said, like, Ray Dalio, like, gets it to 99%. But, you know, <laughs> I don't know what, what's, what's preventing him, like, to get it, just to yeah. get it. Is it because, I mean, would you call Ray Dalio a, a cantillionaire? You know, sort of, he had he has had the privilege of profiting off, you know, of the whatever low interest rate, zero interest rate uh, uh, policies of the Federal Reserve, or you know, just credit expansion, uh, free money, and flowing, you know, into all yeah. these uh, megalomaniacs, you know. Yeah, um, I think yeah, Ray's really close, um, and and he's he's actually this Friday, I believe, he's talking at, uh, at Texas A and M. Uh, Bitcoin conference and he's talking right after Dan Held and Michael Saylor. So about Bitcoin as an investment cl- uh, or uh, asset class. So I think, I think he's, he's there, or at least there's people in his ear at Bridgewater that are, that are there. Um, it, I think it's tough. Like I can't put myself in the shoes of a 60, 70 year old, what, whatever Ray uh, is um, as a 20 year old for me, it's like, I, I grew up in money's basically digital, you know? Um, like Venmo and Cash App and all this stuff, like just the, the, like digital scarcity. I mean, not understanding it at first, but when you when you dig into it, for me, like an internet native, I grew up on YouTube and Google and and had a MacBook and coming up through um, through public school, like we we were on laptops, you know. So so digital uh, digital cash is something that like you know I I can I can get and I can you know. Uh, like distinguish from, from like, I don't know, all these other crypto projects, but with, with Ray, and I don't think he's necessarily a technologist. Um, he's a, he's a genius macro economist. Um, and he's, you know, obviously a billionaire, but for, but for Ray, it's, to be. it's but like, Dylan, does it really need to be? I mean, you know, I mean, there are so many people out there who, who are not technologies, you know, I mean, even zoomers you know, like you or William Clemente or, yeah, yeah. Joe Burnett, you know, these yeah. are Zoomers, you know, you've grown, you've grown up with digital. It's like, it's like your, your second nature. It's your nature, actually, you know, yeah. uh, but is it really necessary to, you know, to understand, because, you know, I don't know how the TV works or the refrigerator or, you know, <laughs> or the car, it, it, but, but he understands, he should be able to understand the monetary properties, the fundamental monetary properties of Bitcoin. Yeah, it, uh, I think, I think Ray does, hasn't done the work. Of, of what makes Bitcoin different um, from from another like I guess crypto asset or or why is Bitcoin not my space and I like that is is something that a lot of people like don't the the biggest skeptics are that's like I think one of the biggest hurdles is like wow yeah why is it different and and Bitcoin's um, Bitcoin's launch and it, it, it's almost like a one off thing it, it can never happen again you know um, and that's that's what I think Ray's missing um, 
among all these other things, like when you call Bitcoin, when you call Bitcoin volatile, it, uh, that for me is like, you haven't done the work at all. <laughs> um, right. Calling the least volatile thing in the world volatile is uh, you're missing the forest for the trees. Right. Uh, exactly. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I just, I, for me, the article, I really tried because, uh, you know, debt cycles and self and, and the monetary system that's based inherently like a hundred percent on credit people mm -hmm. like that is something that people don't understand. And like, for me, like I did a lot of, a lot of reading and research and like the average person, you're not taught this in school. You're not taught this even in like economics. If you're like, I was studying economics my first year in college after I dropped out, like there wasn't, there was a basic level, like, you know, econ 101 course about, you know, fractional reserve banking and all this stuff. But you don't learn really what money is and you don't learn that, that everything that we think of money is really just credit and banks create money through lending. Like that was something when I, I read like the creature of Jekyll Island and I, it, I had a moment where I was like, everything I know is a farce. Like exactly. <laughs> what, what, what other books did you read? What other books did you read Dylan? I would, I'm curious. Like, did you read like tragedy yeah, and horror? Uh, I read, you no, know, like, uh, you know, like books like tragedy. And you know, what's 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 his author? Um, yeah, I just forgot the author's name. But, um, I, I have not. Uh, I've not read tragedy and Holmes. I've read. Um, I read Big Debt Crises. It's a three part series. Um, it's like the archetype. It's then there's detailed case summaries, uh, and then there's like four, like a forty eight. Uh, um, Uh, debt crises that he used to basically form the archetype so i read those um in great detail i read the creature from jekyll island which is all about like some people call it like conspiracy but it's really just a detailed history of fractional reserve banking um i read the price of tomorrow the bitcoin standard all of all of the you know the necessary rabbit hole books um i have started layered money haven't finished it uh, the sovereign individual And, and all of those books kind of sh helped to shape my worldview um, and helped me really navigate like this craziness, you know, of, of the world today, political sphere, um, system, just a lot of things that on the surface make no sense. And if, if you, if you aren't paying attention and really doing a lot of the work, like everything seems to be in disarray. Um, so th that really kind of, me some sort of clarity to what we're living through um and my goal with the piece and it, it was quite long i think is like 3500 words and with all the charts and everything is like 20 pages but for me um my goal was to help people around me um with with maybe an understanding of economics but maybe not um help kind of understand why bitcoin like why it's so necessary and and even if you don't like it or understand it or care to it's it's a necessity that you know um you can't you can't insulate yourself from But, yeah dylan i mean you did a really excellent job i mean i'm just uh screen sharing here your article on bitcoinmagazine.com it's called the conclusion of the long-term debt cycle and the rise of bitcoin with the subtitle the conclusion of a long-term debt cycle is an inescapable economic reality that coincides with the ascent of the bitcoin network now you lay out you know all the symptoms, you know, the, the consequences, second, third, fourth, all the effects. But then you, you know, you, you really brilliantly describe like what are the root causes. And, you know, somewhere along the lines, you know, you, you, uh, you also, uh, maybe you can break it out a little bit for, for my listeners. Like what is the short-term cycle and the long-term cycle, which we are in, uh, like how far are we into that long-term cycle or what do you believe uh, is going to, you know, Is, is there something like, are we talking about years or months or decades? And, um, and you know, where you also yeah. lay out the, you know, the symptoms, uh, like, uh, like whatever the top 20, uh, the top 10% own whatever, like, or like 50% of the wealth of the assets or whatever. So yeah, break it down if you, if you, if you, if you want to. Yeah, of course. Um, so there's, there's three uh, main factors that kind of um, make up Or, yeah, so there's the long-term productivity trend, which is which is a result of human entrepreneurship and, and ingenuity, um, and that uh, happens regardless of, of credit cycles. Um, and so, credit cycles, the short and long-term debt cycle, um, is besides the productivity. That's kind of the vo the volatility you f we feel 
um, as a society, as a global economic uh, system is a result of, of credit expansion and credit contraction. Um, and not, it's not just wildly fluctuating human ingenuity activity. Um, so debt in the most basic form is, is cyclical. So when you borrow today uh, money to consume, invest, to spend, um, you're not only borrowing from a lender, but you're borrowing from your future self. So debt in the most basic way is cyclical. Um, and it's, it's uh, even worse or yeah, it's, it's, a pro it's problematic when you borrow from your future self and it doesn't go to a, to a productive uh, investment or a productive uh, use of that capital. So if I borrow money today to buy a TV that I couldn't afford otherwise, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm basically promising away my future productivity output. And so that, that holds true at an at a individual level as well as a macroeconomic level. Um, you see, if, if everybody, say in 2008, is borrowing to lever to lever up and to buy houses. Um, that is not a productive use of capital. And and ultimately, if there is and when there is a credit contraction, a lot of people are gonna gonna get burned. Um, so we have um, the short term debt cycle, which people most like. You could think of it as the business cycle or the boom and bust cycle. And most people, whether they understand it or not, have a basic sense of understanding of, of what the short term debt cycle is oh, there's a recession and oh, now we're out of the recession. And, and that comes around every seven to 10 years. And most people may or may not know why, but um, it, it comes because um, interest rates, especially in the era of central banking are centrally planned. Um, the, the price of money is set. And so um, out of say a recession or, or just when interest rates are set, a lot of the borrowing is productive it does go to growing the economy, but there is um, just naturally there is speculative there is speculative activities happening, and the self reinforcing um, upwards boom of a credit expansion, which is um, what happens in a in a monetary system, especially um, it it's it's self reinforcing it's self reinforcing to the upside, and a lot of a lot of that use of capital goes to malinvestment. It's misallocated. Um, it's, you know, like buying a house on credit when it's tripled in the last five years is not an effective use. So, so ultimately uh, there's an upwards boom, uh, and, and followed by a downwards credit contraction. Um, and so that is what people think of as a recession. That's, um, and so that is a short-term debt cycle and it's reinforcing to the downside as well. Uh, when, when credit contracts, incomes fall your spending is another person's income. It, it continues down and a lot of people get wiped out. They get liquidated. The malinvestment and misallocation of capital gets corrected. And what a lot of people thought they had as an asset, whether it's a promise for someone else to pay them a bond or it could be stocks, it could be uh, real estate. What they thought they had, they really didn't. It was just an, it was just an effective credit expansion. Um, and so that's about every seven to 10 years. And you can see that just on like a chart of about interest rates. It's like, it's almost like a wave or, or something like that. Um, and so a bunch of these small little seven to 10 year cycles will make up a long-term debt cycle. And this isn't something that like, I don't think necessarily would occur in the wild or it's just a, a fact of nature, but with, with a central bank and centrally controlled uh, price of money, there's these natural short cycles, which put together over a long time span, make up the long-term debt cycle. And so the long-term debt cycle, um, you can see it on a hundred year chart or 80 year chart. If you look at like the, the federal funds rate, it's this, it's this one big wave. It's this, and it peaked in 1980, 1981 up about 20%. And for the last 40 years, we've gone from uh, interest rates at 20% at to today at the zero lower bound. Um, and so when interest rates hit the zero lower bound, it essentially means that the, the main tool used by central banks to, to uh, stimulate the economy is no longer an option. So in, when you cut interest rates, it does a lot of things, but it raises the present value of assets. It makes borrowing easier where you can spend or uh, invest in credit and it reduces debt burdens. So whenever there's an economic slowdown, central banks, especially over the last 40 years, have cut interest rates. And it's allowed for credit expansion to continue. It's allowed for a lot of people that would get wiped out 
would would not be able to, you know, their, their investment wasn't a good allocation of capital. It allowed them to escape by. And so we hit the lower zero lower bound in 08 or 09. We got back up to about 2% interest rates and it, we got cut them back to zero. Um, and that's because debt loads across the economic uh, landscape are, are so high that they really can't raise interest rates. If they did, everything would, would basically collapse. Um, so when interest rates hit zero, it's, it's, basi- it's the end of the long-term debt cycle because unless you can grow your way out of it, which everything, all of the data shows we're not, all we're doing is layer, layering on more and more debt, then, then the, the debt loads are unsustainable. And, and ultimately, it's basically a spiral that ends with the currency being sacrificed. Um, and so when you hit the zero lower bound, you can't lower interest rates. The central bank has their, their main tool, it's gone. And so what they can do from there is they can print a lot of money in the form of quantitative easing, which is buying financial assets. We're seeing that at a massive scale. And the third option, monetary policy three, is they can, it's, it's basically like stimulus checks, direct payments to people. Because interest rate reductions and quantitative easing, especially over the last decade, we've seen from 08 to now on and off, but mostly on, all it does is it pumps financial assets. The bond market, the bond market is just getting cash shoved in it. These investors seek to re- seek to redeploy this capital elsewhere. Equities boom, real estate booms, everything is is pumping. But that and that only benefits the investor class. That only benefits the people that hold these assets. And so, a lot of the the political polarization, a lot of the, the wealth gap and, and the, the rise of, of socialism and um, socialist policies um, and, and, you know, the leaders on the far left and right, the, the Trumps and the Bernies and the, the AOCs and the nationalism and, and uh, Marxism that, that arises is, it's not just, it's not a coincidence. It's, it's a result of, and, and, it's, and the debt cycle doesn't explain all of this. There's a ton of factors at play. But in a, in a simplified way, uh, the polarization of the society uh, results from people feeling like they're cheated. And most people have no understanding or idea of how they're getting screwed. They just know they are. Um, and so we're at a point now where the, the central bankers and the policymakers are trapped. If they stop the easing, everything would collapse. But if they continue to ease and they continue to, to maintain the system, that is at an endpoint, then then the stock market will continue to go parabolic, asset prices and everything will will rise forever, and the lower class, the people that don't have anything to protect themselves, are on a treadmill, and it's it's a road to serfdom. And so, would so you say the in my, central in banks, my essay, I, yeah, would you say the central bank governments are already in a yeah, self-destructive mode? Yeah, and and I think. I think they know. I, th- I think they're not naive, like, especially and myself and a lot of people on Twitter and, and you know, we'll, we'll like to, to clown them and, and to, you know, say, like, oh, you, you're so oblivious. I think they know and they're, they're trapped um, and they're trapped by decisions that they didn't make. Um, and so you, you have Jerome Powell going up there with a straight face and saying Fed policy doesn't contribute to wealth inequality. And, and I think that's uh, somewhat insidious. Uh, because a lot of people watching 60 Minutes probably believe that. They don't even know what the Federal Reserve is. Um, and so, yeah, they're, they're trapped, um, and they're doing everything they can to act like they're not. Um, there's a lot of job owning, and there has been for the last decade, but um, reality tells a different story. And it's that um, if they stop the quantitative easing, if they stop the fiscal stimulus, if they stop all of these things, uh, there's, there's a mountain of credit and not – not even close to enough cash and, and money to, to um, fulfill all of these obligations. And so um, this, this huge debt cycle that we've, that we've had, the secular downtrend in interest rates and credit expansion, the house of cards would fall down and, and it will, it, it will, but we continue to, to kick the can down the road. And that's just a result of political incentive. It's, I'm going to get elected as if I'm uh, a president or a central bank governor or whatnot. And, and I'm not going to be the fall guy. 
you know, everyone's not uh, uh, more of the same. Print some money. Uh, like, you know, everyone's feeling good. Stocks are rising. Uh, people feel rich with a twelve hundred dollars stimulus check. Like, I'm not going to be the fall guy, and that's just that's just not incentives. These people, I don't think they're inherently bad people. I think they're just trapped in it in a system that is a at this point is is lose lose. It's they don't have any choices, um, and so Bitcoin is this natural. Uh, I think it's almost like an immune response. Satoshi included in the Genesis block, Chancellor on the brink of second bailouts for the big banks. Or I might have I might have uh, bundled that one, but um, it, this is a Bitcoin is is a is a response to this madness. Um, and so this this currency regime, this monetary order, is in an end game, um, and and people don't know that because they don't know anything else. The long term debt cycle is something that people don't really understand because most people never ever live through it i wouldn't understand it if i if i wasn't listening to people that said hey go read this book and go read some history and and i went and read the history for myself but what we're seeing today is is very very similar to what we saw almost 100 years ago with with the great depression and the 1930s and and a lot of the the side effects History is repeating itself. Gap and, yeah. and all this stuff. It's amazing. History is oh, 100%. And, and, and but people seem not to learn out of history. I mean, I always, you know, got got to hear that uh, phrase from my history teacher in school. It's like it would be too good to be true if people uh, learn something out of history. But you know, this time I have. I think it's not only me, but a lot of people. Maybe even you. You know, just uh, it's not only intuitively, but it's like you. We we understand this. This is this is our moment. It's Bitcoin or or we are I don't know humanity's loss. Um, let me ask you something because you know we I'm in Austria, so in you you know you're, the people are not uh, much different than in other, any other uh, countries or continents. <laughs> Um, you know, um, I'm in Austria and for example, I mean, I know there are some data from Germany. They, they have like 800,000 zombified companies. Uh, you have unfunded liabilities. The pension funds are broke. Uh, it's really bad. I think people have no idea. They think they're, I don't know, on a blessed island and they're somehow protected by, a, I don't know, by invisible force or something. So, um, um, I think connecting the dots is really important, especially when it comes to the so-called euro dollar, because it's all interconnected, you know, with the Federal Reserve, the ECB, it's all the same. It's, you know, the owners, the controllers of the central banks who are, by the way, untouchable, unaccountable, and criminally immune. This is something, uh, fa uh, one of my favorite topics, because it, it really shows you like uh, how how bad the system is, how how corrupt and and, and untouchable and and. Uh, uh, and unaccountable the system is what's what's your take on on this on the whole you know central banking structure uh, inclusion or whatever as instrumentalized uh you know uh or the government's being instru instrumentalized by the by the central banks yeah i think i mean i think um when the money's corrupted everything is corrupted as a result um and like i think it's kind of a meme where like any topic comes up and it's like, Bitcoin fixes this. And you're like, if you're that guy, it's like, oh, the Bitcoin guy, like, shut, like, oh, bring in Bitcoin into this again. But no, there's definitely a truth to it where um, so many things are broken um, and, and incentives are broken and they're warped. Uh, and for, and it, people have been lulled deep for, for not just years, but decades, their entire lives. Like, Okay, go to your job and contribute to your pension. Who promises eight percent returns? Eight uh, percent of how? Where is that coming from? Like the last forty years, like um, a lot, of, a lot of boomers and a lot of pensioners, um, they may actually have made it out. You know, they may have like have a million dollars from passively contributing to this thing, and they think that they've invested well. But a lot of these returns that they've gotten um, over the last forty years is not a result of prudent investing by someone else. Uh, just to put that there, it's not a result of, of productive investment. It's a result of credit expansion. So, so when rates go from 20% to zero and, and inflation was high in the, the late seventies, early eighties, but when, when rate, when the discount rate goes from 20 and, and there is cyclical periods throughout and they went from 20 to 12 and to 16 to eight or whatever it was at the discount rate of every asset is crushed and the asset value source 
And so you have all of this, this pension math and you have all of these obligations that are promised to people denominated in this currency that we've, there's just been a secular trend of everything goes up. You own it. You could, could be, you know, you could have done nothing else but sit in U S long dated treasury bonds for 40 years and you would have become filthy rich. And now there's no longer that option where people are still contributing to pensions. People are still like, I know some people um, in my, that are my age that have started to buy uh, index funds and they think, dude, you make 10% a year. And if I can, and they're like telling me like, I did the math. If I I put in X, Y, Z amount for 20 years, I'll have X, Y, Z amount of dollars when I'm 40. And I'm like, dude, that's not how this works. Like, I, I mean, I tell them to buy Bitcoin, but like, dude, like, this is not just normal. Like, oh yeah, free money. It's 10% a year. It's like, it's, it's the best way to become rich. Just skip your coffee every morning and contribute. And like th- this, <laughs> this passive investing, like zombification of the economy, all of this, like all the wacky stuff uh, that, that people think and perceive as normal is, is not um, saving money is not a thing. People think saving is investing. People think saving is contributing to their Roth IRA and buying a bunch of index funds that they don't know where the money goes. Like, no, that's not saving. You're investing and you're inherently taking risk. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, to, for your original question, the central bank and, and government, I don't think uh, like necessarily, again, like that they're insidious or that they're, they're ba- like bad people by any means. It's just there's been an incentive uh, to kind of slowly, it's like a slow default. It's a slow train wreck and it's, it's crashing in slow motion uh, and everybody's just kind of along for the ride and there's no way to turn back on the tracks now. It's, we're, you know, we're, we're going to be rolling off the cliff at some point. Um, and so, yeah, I think Bitcoin is our only option. Um if there was something, something better or, or, you know, somehow the thesis changed, we're like, uh, we're not blindly following this thing every day. We're, we're questioning what we know and what's true and what's not. Um, and as of now, the thing that I trust the most in this world is running my full node and securing sats, right? Like I'm not going to trust any politician, no matter how nice he is or, or what he promises me with, with a vote. Like, I'm not trusting you with my future uh, because I don't have to anymore. And that's the beauty of it. Um, you don't have to, to trust anybody. You don't have to put your faith in, in a corporation or a government or some, some old dude in a suit for a central bank. It, and that's the most empowering thing about it. I mean, you know, we are, we are, let's talk about Bitcoin, but I mean, we are still early. It's like whatever, two or 3% of the world's population are in one shape or another, whether they're shit coiners or not. I mean, we've all been there, but uh, let's just say, you know, it's 100 million people. Um, do you think this hyper Bitcoinization process, which is so, so early, it's like in the pure mature phase, uh, is it because the, uh, somehow the, the critical mass has not been reached who have lost trust, you know, in this or understood, you know, the monetary, the banking, the central banking system and, and, you know, the, the, yeah. the matrix sort of, do you, do you think this hyper Bitcoinization process will be triggered once, you know, gradually and suddenly uh, there's a loss of trust and this hasn't happened yet, you know, within the European union or in States or in Canada, whatever, but it hasn't happened yet. Would you say that? Yeah. Yeah, I don't think it definitely it definitely hasn't happened yet. I think the masses are still lulled to sleep. Um, but at the same time, I don't think it necessarily. I think a lot of people won't ever really they they won't understand what's happening. To be honest, um, and I think that's that's just the reality. Where I think Sailor explained it pretty good. He's like uh, Bitcoin and and the Bitcoin uh, monetary network and how it scales. It's not like the internet or like a telephone, like uh, some people talk about Metcalf's law and they're like the amount of users and the amount of addresses on this network scale. It's the, the value of the networks, the, the square of the amount of users. And it's like, well, no, it's not this works. It's about how many people and how much to quote Taylor, like monetary energy is, is coming onto this network. So uh, I, I onboard a lot of people uh, and I get people stacking, you know, five bucks a day, 10 bucks a day, whatever. 
uh, it could be a, a, hundred, a thousand bucks a day. Um, but if I get 40 people or 400 or 4,000 and they're all chipping in here or there, and even if they understand the corruption and, and, and like the fallacy of central banking and, and don't trust their government, that doesn't make as much of a difference as one Michael Saylor or one Elon Musk. You know, like them putting a billion dollars of, of monetary energy on this network. So I think, I think what will happen is we're seeing it now we're seeing um, we'll see it over the next few years. I imagine where a lot of people that in the know, right? Like maybe they're wall street guys or cantillionaires and hopefully not, you know, hopefully the, the, the middle and lower class, the people that have been kind of screwed by this, this, this monetary system over the last three, four decades, hopefully they, you know, a, a critical mass of the, of these people get, buy Bitcoin and, and get on the, the arc, I guess. Um, but I don't necessarily think that a mass, like a critical mass of people will wake up. I think it'll be the, the intrinsic, like intrin, uh, intrinsic minority that, uh, you know, wakes up, sees the, sees how broken this is and goes all in on Bitcoin. And there's still a very, very small amount of people, but that's what does that do to the price? Right. And then price is the ultimate indicator price. Like a lot of people I know know nothing about Bitcoin, but they go, dude, it's gone from 10,000 to 60,000. And when it goes from 60,000 to, to holy crap, it's 248,000. Why is this? Ha well, something's happening. And so I think that is going to coincide with, with losing trust is like, okay, is Bitcoin pumping or is the dollar dumping? Like at some point is the, it's the Bitcoin adoption curve is like, it overlays with the, the, the fall of, of this monetary system. And I don't think we're there yet. I don't think we have a long way to rip before that, uh, before the, the mass of people, you know, loses all trust. I think like, it's kind of disgusting how, <laughs> maybe that's a strong word, but like how much faith people still have after 2020 in these institutions and, and politicians and all of that. But I think the main sign for people won't, they won't be, you know, learning what a decentralized network is or, or how money is created through credit expansion. And they'll just be like number go up and be like, okay, what's happening? Like, why, why is this continuing to go? Maybe they don't even understand that the dollar is just tanking. They're like, this thing just goes up forever. Like I need some. And I think that that will just be the natural kind of forcing function. Yeah, you know, the technological developments um, or, you know, the, the user-friendly applications, whether it be software or, uh, you know, uh, whatever that is, or wallets, it's become like exponentially user-friendly in the last, even, you know, just in the last few months and years. It's amazing. So, and there's, a, there's so much going on behind the scenes. You know, you, you mentioned whatever Michael Saylor and there's so many others with it, BlackRock. And, and, and uh, I mean, I'm just waiting for all the pension funds, you know, that, who have sort of a fiduciary duty to allocate at least a percentage, whatever that is, five, 10%, whatever, you know, leeway they have into, into Bitcoin. It's so I think there's, I think we're going to see a very sudden, process in the next this is my 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 intuition or my understanding how how it will evolve and yeah. as you said you know it's it's not you know the the critical mass you're totally right it's this intran transient whatever it's called uh minority would it be the t the 10 percent uh that's going to like push it like uh over the cliff um is that your your perception yeah. too yeah yeah totally i think um, the, like, so for me is like, I, I kind of focus on like the financial side of, of Bitcoin and like, and, and pitching it and like my latest piece with the debt cycle, it's, it's focused on like the merger of Bitcoin and, and the legacy monetary system and, and what it means and how it fits. But yeah, like a big orange pill for people is not like, you know, the investment banker on Wall Street doesn't really care, or th at least now they don't think they care about sovereignty and you know destroy the governments and like it's not it's not like that it's like okay wait this asset has a higher sharp ratio which is a sharp ratio is uh, max drawdown volatility wise uh compared to annualized returns this asset for the last 12 years is returning 200 percent compounded annually and people call it so risky and volatile but the sharp ratio on it is is higher than any other asset 
So, and so why the hell aren't I owning this thing? Or, you know, like, why don't I have a 1% return? I think like there's some crazy stats. It's like 5% Bitcoin and uh, 95% cash over the last 10 years. Like, even if you rebalance it every single year, it's like outperforming the S&P by a long shot. And it's like the max drawdown of Bitcoin goes to zero is 5% in that scenario. So um, people calling it risky don't, uh, don't understand risk. And they don't understand what volatility means. Um, so that's like a huge orange pill for people is like, okay, we, our pensions are super underfunded. We're holding bonds that yield nothing that with after credit risk and after uh, inflation expectations. And that's assuming CPI is accurate, which I think we both know CPI is a sham. Um, these bonds are, are negative real yielding. Uh, at the stocks are trading at 30 P ratios, all these equities, I should probably own a little bit of this. And, and there's a game theory there too, where mass mutual buys hundred million and like, you know, they're the oldest insurance fund in, in the country. And so their competitor goes, okay, well, I probably need a, at least a 1% allocation. And that 1% allocation turns to two, turns to four. And, and so I think that's like, like I focus on the financial side of things because I think that's my edge in articulating the thesis. But ultimately, I like it's a much deeper Bitcoin, the rabbit hole, the sovereignty, what it does to the, to the nation state. All of this stuff is just like is hidden behind the, the curtain of like, oh, here. Yeah, just include it in your portfolio allocation. And like I think Saylor realizes that, too. He's like, oh, no, it's not. It doesn't hurt the dollar. Like, oh, it's digital gold and you should have some as a Treasury Reserve asset. Like, no, he gets it. And like and for me, like. When, when I talk with like a finance bro or someone that's like, you know, I'm like, yeah, just add it to your portfolio. It's a, uh, it reduces your risk and improves your sharp ratio. Like, but I think there is much bigger than that. But from, from the investment side of things, like mm -hmm. if you're talking to a pension fund, like that's where you're going to, that's the angle you're going to approach it at. And, and they don't understand maybe mass mutual does maybe some people in their, in their fund do know, but most people don't understand that Bitcoin is the unit of account and that Bitcoin is, is the risk free rate and that, and like, and all this stuff like volatility matter and it's a 21 fixed pie. Like they're not at that level of the rabbit hole yet, but I think they're right there. On uh, let me ask you on, um, um, Okay, you, you mentioned Michael Saylor a few times. You know, when he says, uh, he overemphasizes every time, you know, his interviews as if, he, as if, you know, it sounds a little bit like a broken record when he says um, Bitcoin is and cannot be a currency. I mean, what, what what's a currency? Does he mean like a settlement layer or a medium exchange? Or is that, you know, he knows exactly what he's saying and why he's saying or not saying. Is that sort of a you know, a Trojan horse, you know, just to keep it low profile. What's, what's his, what, what do you think? I, yeah, I do believe that I wrote, I wrote like a, I mean, it's not too detailed. It's just a fun little piece is like Bitcoin as digital gold is a Trojan horse. Um, I, I do think that I think sailor understands this at a deep level. Um, and when he is literally saying one day, no, Bitcoin is not a threat to the dollar and then is speculative attacking, uh, the dollar. So, if, if anyone who's listening um, doesn't know what a speculative attack is, you should look up speculative attack by Pierre Rochard. It's on the Nakamoto Institute. It was written in 2014. And it's crazy how uh, far ahead uh, Pierre and, and uh, Bitstein and these guys at the Nakamoto Institute are, but basically talks about how currency and, and money, it, it's all in constant competition with another. And so when uh, going back to the monetary system is when you borrow money, uh, in a, especially in a fiat currency is you create money. So if I borrow money from you at an interest rate, you now hold an asset from me with plus the interest and I hold the money you have. So it, it literally creates money. So when Michael Saylor borrows a billion dollars to buy Bitcoin, he creates a billion new dollars into circulation and takes Bitcoin off the market. And so he is literally attacking the dollar while saying it's not a threat to the dollar. So I do think he knows what he means. Uh, and he um, just getting everybody on a Bitcoin allocation, corporate treasurers. I think that could be one of the things that that hopefully helps ease this uh, this impending crisis of under uh, underfunded pensions and, and all this stuff. I mean, it would be awesome to see uh, the United States, but hopefully around the world where there, there is somewhat of an of an ease of, of transition and it's not ugly because 
the game theory of Bitcoin just incentivizes rapid adoption. And so people will be hurt, especially, and I think one of the best things is the people that get wiped out are the creditors, is the people that, that borrowed all of this money or the people that lent all this money out at zero rates, essentially, you know, if you're buying, if you're buying treasury bonds at this point to, you know, to try to like gain the fed and to sell it to them at a higher price, like, and you're holding the bag, like, great, you got wiped out. Um, and the, I don't think anybody, but the cantillionaires are, are hurt by that or, you know, the banking system. So I think that's a good thing, but, um, yeah, I think Michael Saylor knows what he's doing and it's just kind of like a, a corporate orange pill and it's effective. I mean, he had that, that three month span where he went on every podcast in the, in the, in the world and, uh, you know, talked his book. So, okay. So, um, once we are into, you know, we are already in this competitive game, it seems, I mean, that, you know, I just, uh, just mentioned, you know, it's, there's a lot of things going on behind the scenes. So, um, you know, whatever countries you take, it's uh, like Iran, you know, trying to circumvent the sanctions by, you know, uh, buying off directly Bitcoin from the miners and, and, you know, sort of dictating the price probably and whatever, or, uh, or now, you know, with uh, Marty Bent, a great American mining uh, or other like upstream data, uh, L, you know, using the, the, the otherwise uh, a wasted uh, flared or, uh, uh, gases or whatever uh, to to mine Bitcoin. So, do you think there there is there is this process where we're going into this competitive game where uh, you know nation states out of national security reasons are going to you know top this and 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 then we're going into not only decentralizing the the mining. Uh, uh, structures, you know, because there's a lot of FUD going on, you know, China is controlling everything. And so w- what do you see like in the next few months and years ahead? Yeah, um, I definitely, the game theory um, is going to kick into overdrive um, right now in the mining industry. I don't know too much, but I know that there's a huge semiconductor shortage um, of just in that part. That's definitely um, a result of, of high demand for Bitcoin mining, but that's just a demand for semiconductors anyway. Um, and so, the foundries are all booked, uh, I think, years in advance, and they're they're building up new foundries as we speak. But um, yeah, there's there's that game theory side of things um, at a nation state level, at a state level, at a municipality level, where um, if you're not mining Bitcoin uh, as a as an energy producer, you're at a disadvantage to your competitor. Um, you know, like a lot a lot of these, it's it's actually kind of beautiful. There's there's a uh, <laughs> these regulations and all this onerous stuff from the government about flaring and, and usually the government regulations and whatever, it just adds a ton of inefficiency to the system. But by these, these bureaucratic regulations and all this stuff, it actually incentivizes Bitcoin mining. It's like, it's actually pretty beautiful where, okay, instead of paying for these flaring operations out of pocket and at a loss, just to burn energy, you can plug in a Bitcoin mining rig, uh, take all this excess methane, which is way worse for the environment, and turn it into CO2 um, and mine Bitcoin with it. And you have now this d- digital bearer asset where you can hold it on your balance sheet. You can, you know, if you're, I think Iran, their central bank uh, is is buying all of, or they're mandating that the miners sell to the central bank. And, and Iran sanctioned by the US. And they're one of these countries that um, at the flick of a switch can get shut off from the SWIFT banking system. And so for them, it's like, okay, well, Bitcoin, I mean, I don't know how, how much they've adopted and I wouldn't be surprised if they're holding 100,000 Bitcoin or a significant amount. Um, I think they're incentivized to do so. We don't know and that's, that's the beauty of it, but um, that they're being pushed out. Like the Russias of the world, the Irans of the world, you know, China, I think it's, it's also encouraging to see like the Peter Thiel's of the world and I forget the senator's name um, or one of the guys Warren, in the house. Um, Warren Davidson or... Warren Davidson, uh, there's a, there was a House Republican leader yesterday that came out on CNBC and basically re- repeated oh. the same thing. Like, we yeah. can't ban Bitcoin because we, w- we need to stay competitive. And, like, it's it's awesome to see because people uh, in the Bitcoin space have been talking about it for a while where, like, the incentives are too strong. And once it reaches the threshold, it's, you can't turn it off. You actually have to ramp it up to compete. Um, and so it's, rare, it's very encouraging to see that from the U.S.'s point of view. Um, and I think over the coming years, especially... Um, as the price continues to rip, 
the Bitcoin mining game theory is is gonna is gonna heat up too because they're right now miners a lot of like and it's cool to see I'm not the big on chain analytics guy but I occasionally peek at it and and it's it's very very cool to see the miners aren't selling anymore they're actually net accumulating on top of what they mine so these miners are issuing uh, are taking on debt uh, they're issuing uh, these bonds at at almost near zero cost. And they're accumulating Bitcoin on top of covering their expenses and all that. So um, they're they're net net buyers, um, and I think it's it's the best way to, uh, to to get Bitcoin eventually. I mean, um, you have all this excess energy, nuclear power plants, all this stuff. Um, it's going to kick up in a big way, and I think governments are gonna are gonna take notice, even if they're they're sleeping at the wheel at this point. You know, when, when, uh, because you mentioned the beginning, uh, let me, uh, I want to ask you something about, uh, you know, the, like the future of humanity um, uh, and, and deflationary economies. You, you, just, you mentioned at the beginning, you, you read also Price of Tomorrow. I mean, I love Jeff Booth. You know, he, he was on my show together also with uh, also another episode together with Titus Gable of Free Private Cities. Um, and, you know, this is the, act, this is the, the real, real reason why I'm into Bitcoin, because I, 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 you know, once I understood the, the fundamentals, the essence and the power of Bitcoin, uh, I mean, we, we're not going to recognize humanity again, or at least, you know, other civilizations are not going to recognize <laughs> us anymore. Yeah. Because uh, what do you think, I mean, is going to, because people have no imagination, not, no comprehension, what it means to live in a deflationary economy with deflationary technologies, with our hardest and scarcest money ever created in human history. Um, and the technological innovations, uh, you know, uh, uh, using Peter Thiel's uh, zero to one uh, 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 technological innovation. Uh, what is the path towards human civilizational evolution with rooted in Bitcoin? Where do you see that going? Yeah, I think I think um, even when you study it like us and we read these books, and it, it's really hard to comprehend like how massive this is. Um, people, people have kind of like been blinded to, to what's taken place. Um, and, and this exponential, uh, trend of, of technology and, and Moore's law and things becoming so advanced so fast. And, and it's going to pick up from here with, with how exponential, uh, growth and adoption works. Um, it, it's unfathomable, uh, what it means. And, and just thinking about like 10 years ago, what we had or the iPhone or what, now what like what we have in your, in your hand and to to think about what what's gonna you know what humanity and civilization is gonna look like 50 years from now is or even 10 is is really mind-blowing so um and to, just to kind of think about if okay if we stayed with the current system or we didn't have bitcoin and how how civilization uh and economies and society organize in a system of centrally controlled uh, money and and a centrally you know planned economy and and essentially we're on a trend because partially because we're in the end game of our monetary system and partially because of this technological deflation that is incompatible with the monetary system we're on this road the road to serfdom really uh, we're on this road where um, government and and these central organizations control everything. And people, ascend, like essentially, if you if extrapolate out, it's going to be you live in your pod and you get your your UBI check and your your you know CBDC currency and and you know and that's people people are like oh that sounds great U, UBI sounds great well if they can turn it on they can turn it off yeah especially uh, if you don't get and, your vaccination and, don't forget that you know <laughs> yeah yeah I mean it's a dystopian nightmare uh, and and people can't see the slow creep. Uh, and it's really frightening. And so, without Bitcoin, I would, I would be very, very, very uh, uh, not depressed. Um, I would be very, I wouldn't be very hopeful for for the future of humanity and 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 liberty and uh, just, I guess, like um, free free will. Like it, it's really, it's really a nightmare. And so, the fact that we have now this this opt out, which is which is Bitcoin, and it and it enables and it kind of reintroduces free trade. It it gets rid of it, it abolishes coercion. It's I have I have this, and if, if you want to take it, you can't. And if you want to kill me, okay. Um, like like what's there's no incentive there. 
the return on violence, which is one of the things um, in the sovereign individual, it's, there is none. It's, you know, I have my wealth in my head or stored geographically distributed in a multi-sig. And if you want to take it, you can't. Um, and so in that world, um, along with the deflationary aspects of Bitcoin, where as technology continues to, to exponentially advance, everything becomes cheaper. And you have a world now where because the money's broken, everything else is a monetary premium. And I think that's another thing where like, if, if you say all this to someone in one discussion about Bitcoin, like just, just have, you know, nothing about Bitcoin and I'm just talking to you. You think that like, you know, I took some shrooms and I've lost my mind. I'm like, yeah, it's going to change the world and everything's going to get cheaper and blah, 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 blah. It just doesn't, it doesn't make sense. But uh, when you, when you really think about it and think about it critically and, and think about every single alternative and, and extrapolate from there, um, Bitcoin is our only option. And Bitcoin is, is by far the best because without it, we we live in a world where we don't control our own destiny as, exactly. as individuals. We're, we're subject. We're fucked, Dylan. I mean, yeah. humanity is going to be so fucked. You know, I mean, if if I mean, Bitcoin is succeeding, and and the, the cat is out of the bag, and you know, the Pandora's box opened like twelve years ago, or so whatever, thirteen years ago. So uh, uh, yeah. you know, uh, it's once people understand. You know, I um, I was just thinking. You, you mentioned Elon Musk, and and you know, offering Tesla, you can buy a Tesla for. For Bitcoin now, but once people understand, you know, you can buy now with less and less, you know, uh, of a Bitcoin, like with a with a smallest fraction of a Bitcoin, <laughs> you know, that then yeah. I think people start understanding the deflationary nature. It means you pay less and less for better and more, you know, and it's so simple. Yeah. Once people understand that, then they understand, you know, the power of abundance, uh, which Jeff Booth is preaching, you know, and yeah, yeah. It well, there's never been there's never been an instrument or a technology or um, I, yeah a, just a, a medium where it can absorb all of the world's energy and, and productivity and, and be expressed in in a in a way that is completely up to the individual like every single economic decision um, and and trade and interaction can be you know uh, it can be kind of it's it's all it's all a function of, of Bitcoin and the price and the free market and it's it's all compressed into this this one medium which which I think can hold in today's dollars hundreds of trillions of dollars of of I guess like monetary energy right like all of the all of the things now that have this this massive premium and people just there's no opportunity cost or perceived opportunity cost to spending right saving is just not a thing spending and, and living, especially in America, where everybody lives beyond their means every single year, perpetually, and it have been forever. And that's a result of like, again, the monetary system, the world reserve currency, like Americans spend more than they make every single year, forever. And so um, a lot of these things naturally with, with Bitcoin, they go away. Um, but it's like on a deeper level, it's, it's, it's like pretty mind blowing to think about um, the the chance that Bitcoin can can create a type one civilization where where we can basically harness all of all of our energy and then human uh, like our standard of living is just a second is like just a derivative of energy uh, production and consumption and like energy is such a bad thing and like oh no like and this whole like green uh, movement without people really understanding what energy is and what um, and what it means for their life like you're tweeting about uh, how bad energy consumption is in your car on your iPhone. Exactly. Uh, yeah. they, 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 they would have to give up like their, their, you know, their, their standard of life, everything, you yeah, know, yeah. if, if it wasn't for energy uh, creation, conversion and, and production or, or I don't know, exponential increase of, of, of yeah. energy. Yeah. And so Bitcoin, I mean, Bitcoin is, is not only a monetary technology, but it incentivizes with a direct economic incentive to produce energy at, a scale we've never seen at an efficiency that was never before possible. Um, all of these things like Marty Bent calls it molecule to market. And it's like, it's actually, it's really, really crazy to think about um, what this means for, for humanity, what this means um, in the future. Uh, yeah. It's, it's like, it's just, it's mind blowing. 
Hey, Dylan, I got to get back to my three months uh, baby girl and my girlfriend. Uh, I could talk to you for hours. It was really uh, amazing, our talks. I really enjoyed this. Is, is there anything uh, we missed, like essentially, like do you want or you know, and also maybe tell my listeners where they can find you, anything coming up, new articles or anything? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, thanks for having me on. It was an awesome talk. Uh, covered, a, covered a lot of ground. Um, yeah, you can just find me on Twitter. It's uh, BTCization. Uh, um, yeah, I work for Bitcoin Magazine. Um, I don't have any new articles in the pipe, but I'm sure I'll be dropping some soon. And uh, hopefully we can have a, have a talk again sometime. Definitely, Dylan. Let's repeat this. Okay, Dylan, have a great day. I'll talk to you I soon. Bye-bye. Okay, that was an amazing talk. Uh, so make sure you follow him on, on Twitter. It's uh, going to put in the show notes. And his article is on bitcoinmagazine.com, the con conclusion of a long-term debt cycle and the rise of Bitcoin. Amazing mind. He's a Zoomer, you know, really super young, like Joe Burnett or William Clemente and so many others. So many great minds out there. So, um, yeah, um, please follow me on Twitter, subscribe to my YouTube channel and the podcast platform. And just remember, I mean, uh, it's we're so early and uh with these fundamental properties of bitcoin the essence of bitcoin the absolute scarcity uh the you know the magic sauce of bitcoin difficulty adjustment the halvings uh the the exponential rise in demand and you know and then versus the global asset wealth that is in total which greg frost i think quoted something like 900 trillion us dollars i mean that's going to be sucked into bitcoin eventually over the months and years and decades to come so this is going to be a generational wealth that you're going to be you know transferring to your children and your children's children and uh, it's the power of deflationary, you know, money and deflationary technologies, which are going to transform unrecognizably, you know, our human, you know, our miserable human civilization up to now. So thank you so much again for your, uh, for listening, for your loyalty and make sure you follow me. And uh, if you want to support me in any shape or form, uh, you know, send me some sats and um, yeah, I'll talk to you soon. If you have any questions, suggestions, let me know. Bye. 